Amen. Good morning. Love that song, Sing to the King. That's where we are now as we're in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 20 today, so go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to be talking about this morning the millennial kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And, and I'm excited. These, these are the last, three, the last three chapters of the book of Revelation. We'll, we'll spend the next few weeks here. But this is, this is when it gets really exciting, when we're going to be before the Lord and with him, um, starting here for a thousand years, but then on into eternity. It's what we live our lives for, right? Uh, for, for this moment, for this moment. So let's turn now to Revelation 20. I'd like to ask if you would to please stand as we give reverence to the Word of God. I'm going to read the whole chapter this morning, though. We're probably going to look at the first six verses or so of Revelation chapter 20. But I want you to see the big picture. Starting in verse 1. John writes, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witnesses to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired... Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me pray for us today. Father in heaven, I pray this morning that you would reveal yourself to us in a powerful and mighty way through the studying and reading and preaching of your word. I pray that our hearts and our minds are open to what you would give us today. I pray, God, that there would be no distraction whatsoever from people hearing what you need them to hear today. I pray for the Spirit of God to speak strong, loud, and clear. I pray, God, that you would work past my, my inabilities and, and my incapabilities. I pray you would, you, would, you would work past my insufficiencies and draw attention to the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray that people would hear and understand and believe on Christ today if they'd never given their heart and their life to him. I pray today that Christians would be revived and recharged, and I pray that they would be challenged to be witnesses for Jesus like they never have been before. That is the purpose of reading through the book of Revelation with our church over this last year is so that we would be more powerful witnesses for the gospel's sake, knowing that our time is short, but eternity is forever. Lord, we're thankful for this picture you give us of heaven on earth. I'm I'm thankful, God, that we see this thousand-year millennial reign in which we get a glimpse of what heaven will be like forever. I'm thankful, God, that you have already conquered the enemy. I'm thankful, Lord, today that Jesus Christ reigns and rules and King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm thankful, God, that Satan is a defeated foe. And he, cannot, he has no authority. He has no power. Even today, he does not for the child of God. 
I pray, Lord, I pray, Lord, we will live in that resurrection power. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom. When I was a child, and I, and I do this too with my own kids, but when I was a child, um, I would often imagine myself as, a, as a, uh, a different, you know, what I'd be when I grow up. You know, you do that with your children too at times. I'm sure you dream a little bit. You talk about what, you would, what they would like to be and, and, and what they may be. I mean, I get so tickled with, with Micah sometimes. One day, like, Micah amazes me, and he'll say, man, I, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be a, a doctor. Or he might go further, and he might say, you know, today, today I'm feeling like I want to take care of animals at a zoo. And then there's other days where Micah says, I want to be a dinosaur. <laughs> you know, things like that. Like, but, but I'm saying, do you ever dream with, with your child? I, I used to do it too. I, I remember um, I, I, played, I played baseball growing up. And so uh, there was one year specifically where like, I really thought, hey, I could, I could do this for a living. Uh, you know, I was only like 10 years old. Um, but that year specifically that I'm speaking of, we were playing for the Mariners. And we had this really, really great baseball outfit. And that was the year that I hit my first home run. I mean, I remember I wanted to be the baseball player. I remember once um, I, had a, I had a mad scientist lab. I don't know if you had one of those coming up, growing up, but I did. And I had the cool white coat that you would put on and um, the wacky hair. I had hair then, but, but I had wacky hair then. And you'd have those, you'd have those goggles and, and you had all the, the vials and, and, and the bottles and formulas and stuff. And you make your secret potions, things like that. Uh, I, I went to high school. In high school, there were a handful of things that I had interest in, in doing. Uh, preaching was not one of those. But, but, but uh, being a, a PE teacher really drew my attention. I wanted to do that because I enjoyed, I enjoyed um, uh, weight training class. I enjoyed PE class. Um, I, I remember wanting at one time to be a doctor. And then <laughs> I've always wanted to be a professional wrestler. I mean, that, that, always, that's, that, stuck, that stuck with me. Okay. So, so my boys' dreams, they changed from week to week too. One week, they want to be an astronaut. Another week, they want to be a doctor. Last Tuesday, they were army men. I, I think sometimes, I, I really do, I think sometimes Micah's going to make a great zoologist. And Mally would be a fantastic lawyer with the way that he argues. <laughs> He'd be really good. But dreams, they come and go. They change from time to time. But folks, being a doctor requires far more than wearing a lab coat, right? And calling yourself doctor. No one just wakes up one day and says, I want to be a doctor, and then they start practicing medicine. That's dangerous. The, the decision to become a doctor started years and years and years ago. The decision to go into medicine would have influenced where they went to college, and it would require years of study and training, and you'd have to, you'd have to, go, through, uh, you'd have to go through residency and internships. In other words, a, peop, a person does not just become a doctor to decide that the medical career is what they want to pursue. That decision requires a process. The same applies to anyone in any professional career. There, there are requirements that must be met to enjoy the benefits of that decision, of that career. Career. A career requires investment and time and energy before it becomes a reality. I want to push this further, okay? How many of you today would be so bold and so proud to say, I have a retirement account? Anybody here have a retirement account? None of, okay, all <laughs> some of you do. Okay, we have those. Why? Why do we have retirement accounts? Because when we reach a certain age, we want to enjoy life without having to work so hard, right? So you, you're planning. You're planning for the mid-60s. Nobody wakes up at 65 years old and, say, and says, let's start a retirement fund today. Nobody does. That's not wise. That decision has to be made in advance so that when 65 or 66 or 67 come, you can lay aside that stuff for the money then for your years to come. Maybe you're a parent and you're saving up for your children's graduation. And you don't just wake up on their graduation day and say, I better put something aside for their education. Wise people will plan for that, okay? They'll plan for the day that they graduate. They'll have plans for their kids for the future. And listen, I know we're not supposed to live for tomorrow. I understand that. My mind is not focused on what tomorrow holds because I have to live for today. However, if, I'm going, if I know where I'm going in the future, I need to make decisions today on how it's going to impact the future. Folks, there's coming a day, the day of judgment, when every human being who has ever lived will stand before God. And they will be confronted by God. 
And every human being is going to give an account of the way that they've lived their life. Now, Christians, Christians will be celebrated because they gave their heart to Jesus Christ. We don't fall under the same judgment that you read about in Revelation chapter 20. Christians appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and they are rewarded for their faith in Christ and living for Christ. God sees Christ in them, therefore they go to heaven. But unbelievers, unbelievers, they're not celebrated, they're condemned. And there's coming a day, there's coming a day when that judgment comes, it's going to be too late for people to make last second adjustments. When you stand before God, your decision about that meeting will have been made long before that point. Here we are in Revelation chapter 20. I'll give, if, you, if you haven't read any of Revelation with us, here, here's what's happened. The rapture has occurred. Christ has returned for his church. Between chapters 3 and 4, that takes place. The tribulation and the judgments we've read about, God puts out on the earth, chapter 6 through 18. Israel experiences a phenomenal revival, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The nations and people groups from all over the world come to know Christ during the seven years of tribulation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. The Antichrist and the false prophet, they rise up, but they are defeated and they are cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, 19 through 21. In the midst of the, the, the Antichrist and the false prophets reign, they set up this evil, organized, religious, political, economical, social world system that stands in opposition to God and defiance to God. It too is destroyed. It's called Babylon, chapter 17 through 18. That's been defeated. That's been destroyed. Armageddon, we talked about this last Sunday. Armageddon has taken place, chapter 19, verses 17 through 21. And now, now, here we are in 19, verses 11 through 16. The long-awaited return of Jesus Christ has occurred. Everything we've been waiting for, Christ has returned. Now, here's the question we're going to ponder today. What will happen when Jesus returns? What will happen when Jesus returns? There's so much, folks, to talk about when we arrive at this point in Revelation. If you'll come back this evening, I'm going to share with you some different views on how people view the millennial reign of Christ. But for the sake of not losing you today, here's what I want you to understand. After Christ returns to this earth, he is going to reign on this earth, literally, I believe this, literally on this earth for 1,000 years. Here's why. The Bible teaches us that when Christ returns to the earth, he's going to establish himself as king of in Jerusalem, and he's going to be seated on the throne of David. That's found in Luke chapter 1, 32 through 33. That is a promise that is yet to be fulfilled. When Abraham was promised land in Israel, they were promised a ruler, a spiritual blessing. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And the Bible further teaches that Israel would occupy and fully restore the land that belonged to them even after the days of their cursing in Deuteronomy chapter 30. The Bible teaches that David's line would rule for Ever, giving the nation rest from their enemies in 2 Samuel. So during this 1,000-year reign of Christ, the covenants of old are going to be fulfilled. Israel is going to be regathered. Here's why. Most of them are scattered. There are Jews everywhere across the world. They are scattered abroad. Israel is going to be regathered, converted, and restored to the land they were promised, and they're going to live under the lordship of Jesus himself. These are promises made to Israel that God is going to fulfill. And it's during this time that the conditions on earth are going to be perfect, folks. During the thousand-year millennial reign, when Christ comes again, the earth will be perfect, almost physically and spiritually. The Bible talks about how it's going to be a time of peace. If you'd read Micah chapter 2, Verses 2 through 4, you can read about what the the earth is going to be, how peaceful it's going to be. It's going to be joyful. Isaiah 61 verse 7, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of this honor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. 
The Bible talks about how when Christ reigns on the earth for a thousand years, there's going to be comfort. Comfort. Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her, her sins. Believers living on the earth during that thousand year reign, they're going to experience uh, obedience and holiness and truth, knowledge of God to reign with Christ. And here's the greatest thing about it. Christ will be king and king alone. Christ will rule and reign. And, and we, his followers, we will rule with Christ. We will govern with Christ. Jerusalem, folks, Jerusalem is going to become the political center of the world. There will be no city greater than Jerusalem. Can you imagine, just for a moment, can you imagine a perfect world? Seriously. Can you imagine a perfect world? Imagine a world that is dominated by righteousness and goodness and peace. Imagine a world where there is no injustice, where everyone is treated fairly. Imagine a world where truth influences every aspect of your life. We're talking about education. We're talking about government, commerce, relations. Can you imagine a world without sickness? A world with, that is filled with joy and prosperity and happiness. Here's the even better part. A world without sin at all. Can you imagine that? No. <laughs> Because I don't know what that's like. I, I, we, we don't know what that's like. We think that because we've never seen the world like this. We live in a corrupt world, don't we? we? We live in a cruel, sinful society. We struggle with sin on a daily basis. We experience heartache and pain on a daily basis. We witness natural disasters, staggering loss, injustice, inhumanity, Falsehood seems to sway daily the decisions of the world. Discord, trouble are, are commonplace. We see things like hatred and greed and theft, and we see racism and bigotry and immorality. Just this week in our country, we saw infanticide celebrated, genocide, murder and addiction, and so much more seems to rule the planet. Yet a day is coming, and I read chapter 20, and I know it's coming, where Christ is going to reign and rule, and sin is no longer going to abound. And I look forward to that day. And as a matter of fact, it's not even going to be given thought or publicity, sin won't be. Don't you look forward to that day, that the thousand-year reign of Christ it's going to happen, and we're going to get a glimpse of heaven on earth to come. He's coming to make do on his promises, sure. He's coming to show us what heaven's going to look like. He's going to give us a worldwide display of the glory of Christ, but also the justice and judgment of Christ as Satan is defeated and condemned to hell forever. This will be 1,000 years of heaven on earth. What I wanted to do this morning and tonight is I want to share with you just three things that will happen during the millennial reign that we see here in Revelation 20. I'm going to give you two of those this morning. Here's the first thing. Here's what happens before, okay? I'm going to tell you what happens before. Before this thousand-year reign of Christ happens, Satan is going to be bound. Can I get a hallelujah for that? Satan is going to be bound, all right? I, we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for this. So Revelation 20. By the way, hallelujah was last week. Praise the Lord, remember? Praise the Lord, hallelujah. So there, there's no place for Satan other than hell, all right? And, and we're going to see that here in the first three verses. Look here. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And the only reason he's going to be released is so that God can destroy him. <laughs> okay, God can finally defeat him. Now, here's something about this, about Satan. There's no place for Satan other than hell. He was cast from heaven. 
All right? And now, and now, looking at chapter 20, Satan is going to be cast from the earth. He's going to be cast from the earth. The millennium is the starting point of God reworking everything for the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And a major, major restoration is on the way. And to do that, you have to pick up the trash. And that's what God is going to do here. Satan is the trash, and Satan has to go. And so we read here that an angel from heaven comes down... And this angel is holding keys to the bottomless pit with a great chain. Now, this is the first matter of business that Christ takes care of when he goes to set up his millennial kingdom. You see, Satan has been God of this world, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that Satan is the God of this world. And I say God with a little g. But when Christ comes again, there's only room for one God. There's only room for one ruler, and that God is the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of heaven and earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Satan has to go. He has to go. I've said this time and time again. If you are living apart from Christ, if you are not following Jesus Christ, you are following the enemy. He is not God. We read this clearly. God does not become defeated. God is not bound. People who follow Satan are bound, aren't they? They're they're headed to their demise. He is not God. He is not Savior. He's not worthy. Satan is no good. He is a loser. Satan is a loser. This is the one time I say it's okay for you to call somebody a loser. You call the devil a loser anytime because that's exactly what he is. And all who follow him, all who love and worship him, all all who do as he tempts and deceives, are destined for failure and for judgment. He cannot and will not never be able to give you what Jesus Christ gives you. And that's why God has to get rid of Satan. Jesus is infinitely better than what Satan can give. Satan's days are outnumbered. They're numbered. His defeat has already happened according to the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Satan right now is operating on limited time He's a good-for-nothing loser, and he has to go. And so this angel comes down from heaven with a great chain, and he lays hold of the dragon. The angel's going to do some snake handling, folks, some good old-fashioned snake handling. The the reason that the chain, I, I was caught up on the word great. The reason that the chain is so great is because the dragon is great. He is powerful. This angel is about to handle, though, a serpent. Satan is called the dragon. Why is he called the dragon? Well, it it, it talks about his ferociousness, his oppressive cruelty. He's also called the serpent of old. This takes us all the way back to where? Genesis, right? The, The Garden of Eden. He's called the devil. Devil means slanderer. Devil means gossip. What is Satan but an accuser? He's the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies. He's called Satan. Satan means adversary of the Lord. And he's about to get locked up. (laughs) Isn't that good? He's about to get locked up. We read that he is bound for a thousand years. Significance of the thousand years. A long time. A long time. He's thrown into a place called the abyss or the pit. The abyss is a place of torment. I want to correct some people that may think the abyss is hell. The abyss is not hell, the lake of fire. It is a holding cell designed for the enemy. And this angel is going to bind him. He's going to throw him into the abyss. He's going to close and seal the door a thousand years. That is a long, long time. All right? Satan is a defeated foe. His head has been crushed. All right. I heard a story about a missionary who was visiting in the homes of a village that they were serving. And one day, the story is, they saw in a house that they were visiting an enormous snake. What would you do if you saw an enormous snake? Much longer than the men in the house the snake was. And it slithered its way right through the front door into the kitchen of their simple home. My wife would burn the house down, okay, to get rid of the snake. And, and so terrified, they ran outside and they searched frantically for somebody who might know what to do with the snake well, a neighbor comes by, just happens to be carrying a machete. I don't know about you, but it's good to have friends with machetes. And so this friend with a machete comes by and he says, I'll take care of the snake. And he goes into the house and he decapitates the snake with one clean chop. 
And the neighbor comes out, and he, he comes out triumphant. He assures the missionaries that, that the reptile had been defeated. But there's a catch, he said. There's a catch. It's going to take a while for the snake to realize that he's dead. The snake's neurology and blood flow are, are such that it takes a considerable amount of time for it to stop moving. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, it's cool. I mean, they got, they're, they're endless, but they're kind of moving around. For the longest time, like, I, I, believe, I don't know if this is true or not. You have to Google it, Matthew. But for the longest time, for the longest time, uh, I heard that a snake could, like, reattach itself or something to its head. That's gross. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but, but he says, listen, after this, so what I do is I just throw the head away. He can't find his head. All right, but, but for the next several hours, the missionaries were forced to wait outside while the snake thrashes about. This must have been a monster snake, according to the story, because they're talking about it smashing furniture and flailing itself against the walls and the windows, just, just utterly wreaking havoc. And, 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 so, and so someone said on this, mission, on this missionary journey, the snake killer went on to tell the missionaries, Satan's a lot like that big old snake. He's already been defeated. His head's already been removed. He just doesn't know he's dead yet. <laughs> All right. In, in the meantime, he's going to do some damage, but never forget, he's a goner. Think about that, what Christ has already done. Christ has already slit the head of the enemy. He's already defeated folk. Is he going to do some damage? Oh, yes. Sadly so. He does all kinds of damage, but he's as good as dead. <laughs> he's going to be a goner. Isn't that the truth, folks? The enemy has been defeated. If you're not following Christ today, if you don't know Christ today, you are following death. <laughs> the enemy has been defeated. And every time you get an opportunity, folks, if you're living in the victory of Christ, okay, every time you've got a chance, remind the devil that he is already dead to you. Remind him of that when he brings temptation your way. Remind him of that when he entices you with sin. Remind him of that when he whispers subtle lies. Remind him of that when he seeks to destroy and discourage and divert your attention from the Lord Jesus Christ. Remind him of that when Satan tries to rip apart your life. Remind him of that when he tries to get into your home. Remind him of that when he tries to get into your marriage. Remind him of that when he's at war with this church. Satan has been defeated. His head has been stomped. We have no use for headless snakes. I ain't got no use for any snake, <laughs> but not for a headless snake. I'm always safe when Robbie Bird's here. just want to tell you, <laughs> no snake's going to get me. In this chapter, Satan will not have presence during the thousand year reigns of Christ. Sometimes, and this is, lib I'm taking a lot of liberty with the text, but sometimes I think that there will be like a zone in the new, on the new, you know, the Jerusalem where we are, and there's going to be like there's going to be a section labeled pit, and we can go and peer into the pit and is <laughs> that the devil? Sometimes I think we're going to be able to do that, you know, and, and just make fun of the enemy. Satan won't have a presence though. His activity, his influence, his work stopped for a thousand years. Now he's going to get a small amount of release time. And there's purpose for that. We're not going to bother with it um, this morning. There's purpose for that. But it's just to be utterly destroyed and damned for eternity. <laughs> He's going to be conquered. Second point here. Before the millennial reign, Satan will be bound. Secondly, during the millennial kingdom, saints will reign. Saints will reign. Have you ever, is, it, is anyone here, uh, we might be entertaining celebrities today. But is anyone here today would say that you've had a position of royal, royal authority before. <laughs> Anybody, any kings, any queens in the house? Princes, princesses, okay, none of us have. But to be honest, wouldn't it be cool? Yes, I'm, yes, yes, okay, it's going to be good. Okay, she already knows, she already knows. Wouldn't it be cool to be a king, a queen, to have a throne, to wear a crown, to reign, to rule in a kingdom. John sees thrones here in verses 4 through 6. John sees thrones and people sitting on them who have the authority, the word says, to judge. Now, we don't know what all this means, but the Bible has much to say about what it could mean. Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew 19 that the 12 apostles would be judges over the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3 says that believers will be judges over the angels. Revelation 2.26 says the saints will have authority over the nations. Revelation 5.10 says that the followers of the Lamb will reign on the earth. It was the Apostle Paul who said in 2 Timothy 2.12 that if we endure, we will also reign with him. Now, isn't that something neat <laughs> that, that we get to proclaim even now? So the next time, I want you to do this, okay? They might look at you like you're crazy. That's all right. But the next time that you introduce yourself to someone, don't just tell them your name, okay? Speak to them your eternal identity, all right? I would say, I would say, my name is Peter McDonald. I'm currently a pastor, but I'm in training to be a prince. Huh? <laughs> prince Peter, <laughs> all right? <laughs> One of the rulers of the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. You try that on. I'm a king in training. And, and, and you need to go ahead and practice that. So go ahead and try. Look, look to your neighbor and, and do the best you can and tell them who you are in Christ Jesus. Tell them you're a king. Tell them you're a queen through Christ Jesus. Go ahead. Do it. Be confident in it. That's who you are if you know Christ. Doesn't that feel good? Doesn't it feel good? I should have brought everybody crowns today. All right? But don't, just so you don't get confused, all right, now you're, now you're prideful. Stop it. All right. <laughs> all right. Just so you don't get confused, you're not ruling or reigning apart from Jesus. <laughs> all right. So if you're wearing a crown for eternity, you're just going to give it right back to him. Right? But you're not ruling or reigning apart from Jesus Christ. It's a blessing given to you. Revelation is not your reign Revelation is about Jesus' reign. If he reigns in your heart and your life, you'll reign with him in glory. John introduces not just the saints here in verse 4. I saw thrones and they who sat on them in judgment was committed to them. But look at this next part. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. John introduces us to a second group of rulers in the millennial kingdom. We're talking about tribulation martyrs. These are men and women who have been resurrected to life to join the saints in reigning on the earth during this time. Listen, folks, when Christ comes again, we, the church, we're raptured out of here and we're, we're brought back here to reign with him. But there are, some, there are some who lived through the tribulation and there are some who died, who died in the midst of the tribulation. The tribulation martyrs are those and they are resurrected to life and they are joining Christ and the saints to reign with him on the earth during this time. See, during the tribulation, they were tested by the Antichrist. They were tested by the empire of the enemy. They were executed because why? The scripture tells us they loved Christ. They proclaimed the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received a mark on their, on their foreheads or on, on their hand. They stood for Christ without compromise. And now they're being rewarded. I was reading about a lady named An Isuk. She was a Korean woman who lived through terrible times when the Japanese occupied Korea in the 30s through 1945. This lady took a powerful stand for Christ. She took a powerful stand for the truth of God's word. And, 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 and she was arrested. She was in prison. She, she, was, she, she was on the verge of execution. She was imprisoned in a prison camp for her faith. And she daily refused to bow down to Japanese idol worship, though many, Christians, though many Christians did that day. She was tortured for six years until her release. Throughout her life, though, there were countless examples of God's intervention. On the day of her release, a sympathetic prison guard shouted, Ladies and gentlemen, these are the ones who for six long years refused to worship Japanese gods. They fought against severe torture hunger and cold, and have won without bowing their heads to the idol worship of Japan. Today, they are champions of the faith. And the crowd shouts, praise to the name of Jesus. And they begin to sing joyless, joyfully. There will be much singing and rejoicing 
when the Lord returns. Much like Ani Sook did during her, during her time on earth, this is what's going to happen in the millennial reign. God has a special place for those who take a stand for Christ during the tribulation. He will reward them for their faithfulness. He will resurrect them and they will reign with Christ as co-heirs for a thousand years. Now, a big question that people ask when they read this is, how will they rule? What do they have to rule over? How will we judge? I, 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 don't, I don't want you to think too world linen, okay? I, I'm telling you, don't let this king and queen thing get to your head. It would seem like we would rule different aspects of God's kingdom on earth. We would rule with the rule of love. There'd be a tremendous number of people on the earth who need direction. Remember, not everyone who is, who is living during the tribulation period will have resurrected bodies, which means there will be some, there will be some who will have physical bodies, which means they will have children during the time of the millennial reign. Tribulation believers who have survived will still be in their physical bodies and will still have sinful natures. They and their children can choose to rebel against God, and some of them will. So look at it this way. If we're going to reign during a thousand years, our reign is going to be incredibly ministerial. We're going to be leading people to Christ. We're going to be helping discern. We're going to be giving them the word of God. We're going to be helping them, helping them uh, to understand they need a relationship with Christ. They need to follow and honor Christ. Just because the enemy is in the abyss does not mean sin has been completely defeated. People will still have a sin nature during the millennial reign of Christ. So when Christ comes again, there are going to be people who live through the tribulation. There will be Gentiles and there will be Jews still in earthly bodies. But they must be believers. No unbeliever will be in the millennial kingdom unless they are born during the millennial kingdom. But it's my belief, and many more qualified scholars believe, that Christ with the church and with the martyrs will rule and reign to give direction, wisdom, counsel to those who are in need of it. But one thing's for sure, and I don't want you to miss this, if you're going to reign with Christ in the millennium, you need to know Christ now. If you're going to reign with Christ in the millennium, you need to know Christ now. So this is how we end today. Verse 6 says that they are called blessed. Happy is what it means. Happy, fortunate. Um, it says that they are holy. That means they're set apart for God since they've been resurrected and are allowed to live on the earth during this time. But there's also a warning, folks. There's also a warning. In verse 5, in verse 5, it says, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. During the millennial kingdom, unbelievers will not be resurrected. They will be resurrected in verses 11 through 15 of chapter 20. I'm gonna spend much of my time on this tonight, but I wanna say this to you today. In this life, if you are born once, you will die twice. If you are born twice, you will die once. When I talk about being born once, I'm talking about physical birth. By being born twice, I'm talking about Christ saving you, being born again. Just as there are two births, the Bible teaches us that there are two deaths. One is physical, one is spiritual. Jesus warned us of the second death far more than he warned us of the first death. And so I want to give you a snippet of what tonight will hold. There's an after effect. After the kingdom, after the millennial kingdom, sinners will be condemned. There's going to be a time of justice and judgment for all of those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not want to appear before the Lord at the great white throne judgment. Unbelievers are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to give an account for their lives. Now, I've often thought of it this way. I've thought on this day that every lost person who did not have the Lord Jesus Christ, when they stand before God, it's almost like they're going to have to relive their life through flashback. They'll see what they did, where they went, what they thought. However, my perception of that is changing. 
I think this. I think the greatest horror of the great white throne judgment will not just be the judgment that sinners will receive for the sinful things they have done. I believe the greatest horror will be that they will be reminded, interrogated, and brought to the reality that their name is not found in the Lamb's book of life. And they had opportunity after opportunity to give their life to Christ while they were here on earth, but they did not. What a tragic day when so many people, countless people realize that Jesus really is Lord, that Jesus did love them, that he did long for them to be saved, that he went to great lengths so that they could be saved. The almighty God of heaven sent his son Jesus into the world so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But here's the tough part about Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15, and this is this. There will be no do-overs. There's not going to be any second chances. There's not going to be a chance for a defense or an argument or a compromise. There is no plea bargain. They will be sentenced, condemned to hell in the lake of fire forever, for all of eternity, separated from God. I think that is the tragic horror of the great white throne judgment, is that God, God will condemn people who have not given their hearts to him in this life here. I believe that there is great reward and celebration and praise for those who, don't, who do know Christ and live in the millennium. But I also believe there's a great deal of loss, devastation, and judgment for those who do not know Christ in the time after the millennium. I want to ask you this today. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been born twice Will you reign with Christ? I mean, you look, at this, you look at this scenario here in Revelation chapter 20. Will you be one of those who reign with Christ in the millennium and ultimately for eternity? Or are you looking in verses 11 through 15, you're like, that's me. That's me. My, if, I, if, if God opened up the book of life today, my name would not be found in it. Will you be rejected and condemned to hell for not knowing Christ as your Savior? It is the most important question ever asked to any person who have ever lived their life. Do you know Christ as Savior and Lord? Are you going to reign with Christ and rejoice with Christ? Or will you be rejected? Let's pray for a moment. Father, <coughs> we are entering into the most important time of the service today. And I pray, God, that every person in the room would know for sure that if Christ returned at this moment, that if their life ended at this moment, that if eternity presented itself to each person this morning at this moment, that we would know not just where we would spend, but who we would spend eternity with. Heaven is not heaven without Jesus. It's not enough for us to say, I want to go to heaven. No, I want to go to heaven because I want to be with Jesus, the one who paid the price for me, the one who loved me, the one who gave himself for me, the one who did everything possible for my soul to be saved and secured for eternity. I pray today that no one in this building and no one listening over the airwaves would say no to Christ today. Help them to know they have an invitation right now to put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. I want to ask you today, do you believe on Christ? Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? Would you like to follow Jesus with your life? There might be someone today that's saying, Peter, I do. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to repent of my sins. I want to trust in what Christ has done for me. I want to give my heart to Christ. I want to ask him to forgive me and cleanse me. I want to walk with him. I want to spend eternity with him. I want to reign with Christ because he reigns in my life and my heart. If that's you today, would you be so, would you be so able this morning to just get up from where you're sitting and come, come forward? I'd love to pray with you and encourage you. And if not, you can pray right where you are and say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and heal me. Make me whole. 
I turn from my sins and I turn to walk with you. Father, please, I, I believe on you. I believe on what Christ has come to do. I believe that he came, he died, he rose again. And he did all that to pay the price for my sins and to purchase me a place from it. I receive that by faith today. I give my heart to Christ today. If that's you, please do not hesitate to say, I'm following Jesus. We want to rejoice with you. Maybe this morning, this message, I hope this is the case for Christians, would challenge us to pray fervently for lost people. To pray with the understanding that, yes, there is coming a judgment day. (laughs) We need to be praying for lost people to be saved. We need to be praying that we would be laborers who go into the harvest, for the harvest is plentiful. May we be one of the laborers who makes an impact for the harvest of Christ. Maybe your heart today is moved to come and pray for lost people in your life. Family, friends, close peers, fellow workmates. Maybe you want to pray for the week ahead. Maybe you want to pray for our church this morning. Pray that we would stand boldly for Christ in the days to come. Maybe you want to pray for the current situation in this country. We talked about all the sin and the filth. Maybe we want to, maybe we want to come today and just pray a prayer of, of thanksgiving and praise to God that he has not judged us fully here because he certainly could. Maybe we want to pray for mercy and grace on our nation. Maybe today God is moving you to obedience. Maybe he's leading you to join our church family. Maybe he's leading you to take that first step necessary after salvation to be baptized and to join the family of God. Whatever the Lord's doing today, I pray you'd be obedient. So, Father, as we continue to pray, we ask that you would have freedom and liberty and power to move in our hearts and our lives during this time of invitation. I pray that no one would move too soon. I pray we would not become distracted. I pray we would not be a distraction. I pray that during this time, if someone needs to give their heart to Christ, if someone needs to turn their life over to Christ, they would use this time to do just that. So, God, we commit to you during this invitation. Thank you for being our reigning, conquering king. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Robbie, would you just play softly? If, if someone would like to come respond to this message today, I'd be willing to pray for you, encourage you in the Lord. But you come.